Hello, my name is Pat Worthington, and I'm a nutrition support clinical nurse specialist in Philadelphia. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to view this video today, in which we'll review the recommended practice changes for the use of filters for parenteral nutrition administration. The goal for today is to introduce you to the practice changes that are found in this paper, which was published in NCP in February of 2021. First, we'll take a quick look back at how the recommendations for filter use have changed over the years as background and context for our discussion. Next, we'll discuss the roles of filters in promoting patient safety and review the consequences of infusing particulate matter. And then finally, we'll summarize the current ASPEN recommendations that are found in this paper and offer procedural guidance for managing some of the clinical challenges that arise related to filter use. Recommendations calling for the use of filters during PN administration first appeared more than 50 years ago. In 1969, doctors Wilmore and Dudrick suggested using filters during PN administration as a strategy for preventing infectious complications. Then in 1994, the FDA issued a safety alert in which they called for using filters to reduce the hazards of precipitation associated with PN. This came in response to reports of two deaths and at least two cases of respiratory distress associated with the infusion of unfiltered PPN formulations. The FDA Ish suggested using a 0.22 micron filter for dextrose and amino acid formulations and a 1.2 micron filter for TNA admixtures. In 2002, the CDC guidelines for the prevention of central line associated infection recommended against using filters for infection control purposes. And I'm going to come back and talk about this in a little while. 2004, Aspen released its Safe Practices Guidelines, and this document reiterated the FDA recommendations for two filters, but also suggested that when considering particulate and microprecipitate contamination, a 1.2 micron filter could be used for all PN formulations. Then in 2016, the manufacturers of lipid products changed their product instruction Call and call for filtering all ILE products. Now, this new recommendation would require people who use two and one and a separate infusion for lipids to use two filters of different sizes for all PN administration. Following this change in recommendation to filter ILE, Aspen conducted a survey and gap analysis to evaluate current practice. In some cases, filters were not used at all. In others, they were only used for certain patient populations such as neonates, but overall considerable variation in practice existed. The reasons for lack of compliance with filter use varied, and they included things such as doubts about the strength of available evidence, a poor understanding of the risks posed by particulate matter, concerns about costs, frustration with the clinical problems that can occur, such as low flow rates and occlusions, and the belief that filters do not screen microbes. So now I'd like to take a closer look at the CDC recommendations for filter use that have really been a source of confusion for almost two decades now. In 2002, the CDC guidelines for preventing central line infection stated, do not routinely use filters for infection control purposes. The CDC made this recommendation based on the understanding that most contamination occurs after the fluid is passed through the filter and that contaminated IV fluid is a very rare cause of catheter-related infection. In addition, the CDC suggested that PM formulations be filtered in the pharmacy. Now, this might have worked for infection control purposes, but it would not protect against precipitates that can form in PN admixtures hours after compounding. And in any case, filtration is not possible with the modern automated compounding devices that are commonly used today. Evidence from the literature suggests that these recommendations may have inadvertently created the impression that filters serve no purpose in PN administration. And it's not uncommon to hear clinicians say that they don't use filters because their infection rates are low, or they only filter neonatal parenteral nutrition, or that our PN formulations are filtered in the pharmacy, so we don't need to use inline filters at the bedside. 
So now let's review the characteristics of intravenous filters. Depending on the design, the pore size, and the electrical charge on the filter membrane, filters can block particles, microbes, endotoxin, air, and lipid droplets. The two commonly used filter sizes are the 0.22 micron filter, which retains both microbes and particles, and the 1.2 micron filter, which primarily blocks particulate matter. The ability of these filters to reduce exposure to particulate matter during PN therapy is the most important role they have in promoting patient safety. It's important to keep in mind that all IV fluids contain particulate contamination, similar to what you can see in this image on the slide. Most of this occurs in the subvisible range, which is defined as less than 100 microns, so it presents an invisible threat, and it's unlikely that visual inspection of a PN admixture would detect the presence of particulate matter. Studies also document especially high particle loads in PN formulations, and this is due not just to the complexity of the formula itself, but also to the need that many patients have for IV drugs in conjunction with the PN therapy. Estimates suggest that for patients receiving PN in conjunction with IV drugs, daily exposure to particles could exceed 1 million particles that measure greater than or equal to 2 microns. These particles greater than 2 microns, which are retained by a 1.2 micron filter, are believed to carry the most significant potential for adverse consequences. However, particles smaller than 2 microns are also under investigation and may potentially cause systemic risk. Fortunately, filters retain more than 98% of particles present in IV fluids. Numerous case reports found in the literature have demonstrated that precipitates containing calcium and phosphate pose the greatest risk to patient safety. However, particles can also arise from drug-drug incompatibilities, drug-nutrient reactions, or even from the infusion components and equipment themselves. As you can see here in this image, there are giant particles present in the IV tubing. And this is the reason that Aspen guidelines re routinely advise against infusing medication in conjunction with PN whenever possible. Now let's review the clinical effects of particulate infusion. Respiratory compromise is the predominant consequence of particle infusion. The typical presentation includes symptoms ranging from fever, dyspnea, and cough to full respiratory failure and even sudden death from cardiopulmonary arrest. Heavy particle loads have also been associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome and systemic inflammatory response syndrome. These detrimental effects appear to be more pronounced in neonates, the critically ill, and those with pre-existing tissue damage, say from trauma, surgery, or sepsis. Prolonged or intensive IV therapy, as is frequently the case for PN recipients, also increases the risk posed by particle infusion. Preliminary studies suggest that inline filtration may reduce complications in length of stay in ICU, but some of these studies include the use of 0.22 micron filters, so more research is needed here. So this brings us to the 2021 updated Aspen guidance for filtering PA. Based on the best available evidence and guidance from scientific and regulatory agencies, Aspen recommends using a single 1.2 micron inline filter for all PN administration. This includes total nutrient admixtures, dextrose and amino acid admixtures, and lipid injectable emulsions. The safety of using a single 1.2 micron filter for PN administration has been supported by decades of experience in hospital and home care settings. It alleviates the confusion and the potential for error associated with using two filters of two different pore sizes, as the 2016 recommendation from lipid manufacturers would require. It also simplifies filtering practices and could potentially increase compliance with recommendations for the use of filters and PN administration. This illustration that you see here demonstrates the proper use of a 1.2 micron filter for PN administration. For total nutrient admixtures, the filter should be placed as close to the catheter hub as possible. With two-in-one admixtures, the filter should be placed below the Y site where the dextrose amino acid component and the ILE co-infuse, as you can see here. Again, the filter is placed as close to the patient as possible. 
One of the most common complaints we hear about IV filters is that they have a tendency to clog and set off high pressure alarms in the pump. This can be an enormously frustrating problem for nurses to manage. The first step is to recognize that this problem does not represent a defect in the device, but rather it's evidence that the filter is doing its job. It's working as it's supposed to. The first step is to rule out causes of high pressure alarms that are not related to the filter, such as a forgotten clamp or a kinked piece of IV tubing. Next, verify that the correct filter has correct size filter has been used. So if a 0.22 micron filter is used for a, an infusion containing lipid, the, the pore size will not allow the lipid to infuse and it will cause a clog in the filter. If the correct filter size is in place, then, it, then it's time to assume that particulate matter is the cause of this problem. Remember that precipitates can occur hours after compounding, so you may have a situation where the infusion seemed to be moving along just fine, and then hours into it, you, you have this problem. The clogged filter should be removed and replaced with a new filter, but be alert for repeated episodes of occlusion. If that admixture is contaminated with particles, it's likely to reoccur in the new filter over a period of time. A pharmacist should always be involved to review the formulation and the factors related to it to determine the cause of the occlusion. And the most important piece of information is that the PN admixture should never be allowed to infuse without a filter present on the tubing. So now let's, remove, let's review some take home points. First, inline filters serve a critical role in enhancing patient safety by reducing exposure to particulate matter during PN therapy. Next, respiratory compromise is the predominant effect related to particulate infusion and numerous fatalities have been reported. Aspen recommends using a single 1.2 micron inline filter for PN infusions. PN formulation should never infuse without a filter. And Aspen recommends that healthcare organizations that do not filter PN admixtures or ILE reevaluate these decisions and consider the small cost of filters in comparison to the increased mortality and morbidity that may result from not filtering ILE or PN. I thank you for your attention. We have a few references here for you. This educational offering was provided to you by Aspen and supported by an educational grant from the Paul Corporation.